Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at this education panel. Today, we're going to be talking about Jean-Paul Riopelle, his global and contemporary legacy. And my name is Sarah Angel. I'm from the Art Canada Institute, where I'm the executive director. And I'm honored today to be talking to Manon Gauthier, who is the executive director of the Riopelle Foundation. Welcome, and thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. I was really looking forward to it. I want to acknowledge also uh, the presence of Iseut Riopel, the, uh, the, the, the artist's daughter, uh, who's with me today. I'm very grateful to have her here. We've had long discussions, and I'm learning so much every day uh, because and with Iseut, so I want to thank her for being here. Welcome, Iseut, and thank you for being here. And, and so, Manon, uh, there's some really exciting news that is happening around Jean-Paul Riopelle, and it is because uh, next October uh, 2023 will be his centenary, the centenary of his birth. And can you tell us a little bit about why that is so important and, and um, what you are preparing for it and, and why the foundation was created? The, uh, the dream of Jean-Paul Riopelle to have a foundation dates back to the late 60s. There were several attempts over the years, but his primary idea uh, emerged from his years at the MAG Foundation in Saint-Paul-de-Vence uh, when he was working in, in, in studios and workshops. We can think of Les Ateliers d'Artistes d'aujourd'hui. And um, his, 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 his only wish at the time was really to bring together artists and artisans of various trades in what he thought was, you know, trades and techniques that were agonizing. So for him, it was that very meeting between the artists and the artisans and the various techniques. Um, so bringing people together, which is what we're doing today by creating this foundation. That's, fa that's fascinating. And, and why has it taken so long to be realized, the idea of the foundation? <laughs> uh, well, I can't speak for Riopel, but uh, there were several attempts over, over the years until, um, you know, came along um, a great philanthropist and collector in British Columbia who worked along with Madame Riopel to really make this dream uh, uh, a realization. You know, the, the foundation did not see the light of day while the artist was alive for several reasons, you know, various attempts and the very world of, of philanthropy an artist foundation, the very models uh, that differ around the world. Riopel had studied many of them in, in Europe, but, you know, in his many travels, so I some ideas in France, other ideas that came also back to Quebec on the very site where uh, you have the National Museum of Fine Arts uh, in the 80s as well, the old prison that was there. So I think the experimentation, the exploration, we're here today, almost 20 years after his passing, and we are honoring this dream of bringing together artists, disciplines, philanthropists, collectors. But I think that for the Riopel Foundation, it's very much also about honoring his memory, his artistic legacy. But there is a very strong component uh, to the foundation that really seeks to transmit knowledge. So you either discover Riopel, rediscover his art and his techniques. You know, for a career that spanned over 60 years, um, over 7,000 artworks um, around the world. You know, you have Riopel artwork in over 60 public collections in the world, over 18 countries. So we have a very important story to tell. Well, that's a perfect segue into learning more about his career. Here's a, a, a picture of a very young Riopelle who began creating art as a young boy. And, and here we're looking at a work by uh, one of his, his teachers, um, uh, somebody named Henri Bisson, and then um, a work that Riopelle did. Looks totally different from, from the way that we think about Riopelle today, the way that we understand him. Can you tell the audience a bit about his early days, about, about the start of his career? 
Absolutely. Um, his parents actually encouraged him to, uh, to, to take drawing and sketching lessons. And uh, here in his very hometown of Montreal at uh, Ecole Saint-Louis-Gonzague on the Plateau Mont-Royal. Uh, and uh, that's where he took uh, these lessons with Henri Bisson, which was very the, the fundamentals of art. Um, and, um, you know, at the time, obviously, um, the very realistic, so the, the copying, uh, the, 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 the portrayal of, of nature, of landscapes, of still life, of so very all the basics. Um, another thing that was also important at that time is, uh, you know, in French you say faire l'école buissonnière. So here we could say école buissonnière because they also did a lot of field works. And I think that what you have also is, uh, is experimentation. Is Saint Fabien is a good example of that as well. So. Through that experimentation, I think that he was seeking also to find his own style, to find perhaps something more challenging and not so much emulating the, the still life or the, the, the pictural uh, aspect of it, but really depicting the world the very way he, he saw it. Um, so his techniques evolved also over time. He attended L'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, uh, but you know, there was a very rigid framework uh, there. Um, that's where he also encountered many of his, uh, his friends from Le, Les Automatistes. Um, but that's also why Jean-Paul Riopel went to Polytechnique. That's also why he went to L'Ecole du Meuble, so that he could explore a diversity of, uh, of disciplines and techniques because his interests were, were very versatile as well. So, so he here is a, a painting from later on. He's gone to, to start um, studying, in fact, um, with Bourdois. At, yes. at, uh, and his style has transformed quite a bit from what we saw previously. And he also begins to, to be in conversation with Les Automatistes, who are so important in the story of both Canadian art history and international art history. Um, can you tell us a bit about the impact and the, the relationship between Riappel and Les Automatistes. Absolutely. Isert often reminds me that it was not an extremely long period of his life and of his career, but it was one that was very significant, uh, especially considering the times. You know, you're looking at, uh, at, at social conventions and the rigidity of the church and the, 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 the feeling also that some of the teachings were limiting the, the, the very expression of their creativity. So I think Les Automatistes was really a plea for freedom at the time, for, for total, unconditional artistic freedom. Um, so that's where he met uh, Marcel Barbeau, that's where he met uh, Madeleine Arbour, Pierre Gauvreau, Fernand Le Duc. Uh, there were many women very important also in the Automatist movement. So I think if you look back at the time, the late 40s, I think that's also very significant that men and women came together uh, for this important cry uh, for, for unconditional artistic freedom. If you look at today, the themes that were relevant then are still very much relevant today when you think about artistic freedom. The uh, Refus Global will also be 75 years in 2023 on the occasion of the birth of uh, the, the centenary of Jean-Paul Riopel. Uh, and many of the automatists are still with us, fortunately. Um, and I think it's a very good uh, opportunity also to honor that very important time in, uh, in, 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 in Quebec society, in Quebec culture, Quebec politics and religion as well. And, and for those in the audience who don't know about the Refus Global and the importance of it. Can you tell us in a phrase or two about its significance? Well, the significance is tremendous. It's not a very long work to read. I think it's, uh, and it's, you know, more actual than ever. So it is really that, that plea and that defiance of the, 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 the conventions of the time and that call for, for total and absolute freedom of expression uh, artistically. But if you look at today, it is still the case when we're talking about cultural appropriation, when we're talking about censure, when we're talking about um, the very act 
of creating should not be limited by convention. It should not be dictated also neither by politics or social convention. So that's very much. And when you say it's a it's global refusal, it was an act of rebellion, but it was also um, an act of you know that created an intellectual legacy for the entire province. And you know it's not unrelated or too different from the uh, surrealist rupture inaugurale, inaugural rupture. So you see that in the, the world, the post-war world, that this call for expression, for autonomy and independence from artists was, was ever present. I would say there's some universality uh, about it. The one thing that is uh, that always I puzzle with still today is just the very name of automatist. Just see if we, uh, without getting into the semantics too much, but something I'm struggling with is, you know, the, the an automatic movement uh, seems repeated, seems not as as indicative of the spontaneity uh, of the 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 impulses, the creative uh, input that has no framework from the beginning and the end. So that's something I think that is still very relevant. Very relevant. So then um, Riepa leaves Montreal and he ends up going to Paris. And he's um, certainly no, renowned in the 20th century of the canon of 20th century Canadian art as the artist who has had the most global impact. And, and very much this begins with his work that he's doing in Paris. Um, when he goes to Paris, can you tell us a bit what a, about this famous work uh, that he creates and mm -hmm. a, a, a bit about what happens, what takes him there, uh, and then how the story unfolds? Absolutely. I think the, uh, you know, in the late, late 40s, uh, he gets to France, and um, that's where his network really takes off. That's where I think his association with the Surrealist movement had as much to do, if not more, with with the company he kept there and those that, that he met uh, at the time as well. That really, I think, helped shape uh, his, his views on, on, on art. I think it was more about inspiration also. Riopel always said it was not so much about the influence. Uh, the, the, the only artist that he said had influence on him was Ozias Le Duc, mm -hmm. an artist that he visited on occasions back in, in Quebec and who's, you know, he was fascinated with Le Duc's technique of, you know, taking sometimes four years to create a painting, applying, reapplying paint. Uh, um, I was discussing it with Desert also over the seasons, you know, if it was the fall, then he made the, 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 the leaves fall. If it was winter, he made it snow. And, you know, at the end, the three would be this gigantic uh, uh, masterpiece, but it, the, the thought process and the, the, the freedom and the evolution of, of the art, I think, had uh, deep influence. But I think that the, the years in Paris were also probably echoed by the vibrancy of, of Parisian life, uh, by the, the, the work where Riopel got his first studio uh, in, uh, on Rue du Rantin, what you see on the screen in, in 52. And um, he had a tremendous production of works in those decades as well, and experimented with techniques and experimented with matter also. Um, when you look at those artworks, you see that huge concentration of, of color, fragments of landscapes, and um, you know, talking about techniques, there's much that is said about Riopel painting directly from the, uh, the paint Tell us too. about that, Manon. Like, I think in, in many ways, um, the, the innovation, the technique that Riopel is most renowned for, using a palette life, yeah. that is something that begins while he is working in Paris. And, and uh, for those who aren't art historians in the audience, what, what, how does this innovation, how does this technique come to pass? I think it's, uh, Isert says that uh, Riopel is an alchemist of matter. I think that matter was extremely important 
with Ferriopel, as was experimentation. And it's not so much that he painted directly from the, the, the tube. He experimented with paintbrushes and various other techniques. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the fragment, the filament of, of colors in there and the, and, and, and the application, the experimentation with impasto, where you have really thick layers of paint, and that's very typical, almost sculptural in, uh, in Riopel's work. And um, I think that he found there um, the very way that, you know, the 50s brought to life that movement. When you look at the 50s, when you look at Riopel's artwork throughout his, his career, you see a lot of movement. Mm -hmm. And it's not foreign to his very own travels to France, his very own travels around uh, the, the, the continent also with the family. You know, Riopel was joking about, you know, traveling is sometimes just to, you know, go and find titles for the paintings that were already done. Um, I know that uh, Isert and Sylvie were often uh, called to uh, sit in the room and uh, determine titles the for the painting. Fascinating. It is. So there's something, you know, sometimes we, 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 we think a lot and we overthink the very significance of a painting. You know, with Riopel, you have many untitled. For that reason, it leaves room to the entire imagination. But, and sometimes the titles are completely unrelated because they're the result of uh, either a travel or a game. Or, but um, those years, I think, are what made... Uh, propelled his career, but there's so much more when you look first, when you look back at the before those years, uh, and then when you look after. And I know we'll get to the 60s and 70s also. But uh, I think the mosaic uh, period, uh, main is international fame and renown, and I think that it was really motivated uh, also at the time by those exchanges with the surrealists and with artists like Zhou Wuki, uh, Viera, and uh, his years with the uh, Pierre Loeb uh, group of artists. And, and Manon, you had talked about how in the 1950s a lot was going on in the world, a lot with movement, a lot with techniques, etc. I wanted to show this, these two images side by side, not because the painting technique is the same, mm -hmm. but because there were, were two artists who were working in the same way at the same time, Jean-Paul Riopelle, Jackson Pollock. Um, the, uh, on the surface, there appears to be a similarity, but can you tell us about uh, perhaps how inaccurately they are sometimes compared? Yeah, it's a long myth also, and there were many debates and many studies on saying, you know, who was copying who. That's not what it's about. And as you can see also on those uh, on those pictures, is the very technique is completely different. You know, dripping, it is the very act of dripping. Uh, the, 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 the technique that Riopel was using, using his paintbrush, and it's more maybe the precursor of, of, of spraying. It's a, you know, and, and we'll, I know we'll talk about that a little later, but, you know, when you think that, you know, with time, uh, Riopel started experimenting also with various techniques, just look back at these. And that's why movement is also important and understanding the history uh, around Jean-Paul Riopel's artwork and looking at those images, you could see also that they were two completely different ways of looking at art and of working the, uh, the art. So thank you for putting that picture on, actually. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating. And, it's, and what's also fascinating is that um, when Riopel is living in Europe, he, he's living there with Joan Mitchell, who we see in this, this image. And, and Life magazine ends up doing a story on Jean-Paul Riopel um, and, and saying that he is the heir to Claude Monet. And that, and uh, uh, the comparison of this work of this Monet painting, uh, the Jean-Paul Riopelle painting, um, it's fascinating that that uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is um, Monet's work looks abstracted, but it's not. He's looking at his garden, um, and and was Riopelle's work abstracted? And where can you tell us a bit about the influence of Claude Monet on his career? Yes, I wouldn't say. 
influence, I would say inspiration, certainly. I think that it's important to, to look back and honor the artists that came before. In the case of Jean-Paul Riopel, it's also true today, because when you look at, for example, what Marc Seguin is doing, and also the air of Jean-Paul Riopel artistically, there's continuity in the world of art when you look at artists. And you know, I'm always puzzling with the fact that we are comparing. Here, it's not about the comparison, it's about the continuity. And it's about finding that source of inspiration mm -hmm. and the fascination that Jean-Paul Riopel did have. And when you look at these paintings, you will see that perhaps there's no way that we could get into Riopel's mind. I want to be clear about that. I know sometimes people say, you know, what was he thinking? It's impossible otherwise, uh, you know, I wouldn't have figured it out. But, you know, Isa could speak at length ab about that. But you, you see fragments of color. So perhaps you say, you know, the inspiration about landscape, um, you see the elements that you will find in Riopel's art, um, fragments of landscape, of color, experimentation. Riopel said he never painted anything abstract his entire career. He said that's just the very way he, he viewed the world. Um, you can look at Pavan, you could look at Indian Summer, you could look at several works by Jean-Paul Riopel, where you could look back and think, well, was this also greatly inspired by, by, by Monet? And, and I think part of the inspiration with, with Monet is that he was living in very cl close proximity to where Monet had lived. L'esprit so, des lieux, yes, effectively. Yes. So being so immersed and in the, uh, when, uh, you know, when Riopel lived in Veteuil with John Mitchell, and that was also an extremely, extremely important period where he was deeply immersed in the community, you know, going to the cafe, being friends with the, uh, the locals, exchanging, living. So you do find that vibrancy in his art, and uh, I think that honoring also, you know, the, the, the shared passion for these two artists for that region is, is also very important. I put, I put this image on the screen because, again, it is, it is an image <laughs> that is not an abstracted image. Yeah. And then I have these images because it, it leads into a question that I wanted to ask you about an exhibition that um, was on here in Montreal at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and now is at the Audain Museum in Whistler. And it it's, um, tells another component of Riopelle's career, which is that Riopelle came back from France to Canada, and there he, in Canada, there was a tremendous amount of inspiration, both from indigenous cultures as well as from the North. And can you tell us a bit about the exhibition that is now taking place uh, and the genesis of it? Well, that's an idea that goes back to the early 2000s that Isot uh, um, um, created. It took some time, you know, to process and to get museums really to address the reality also of, uh, of, of the Great North and indigenous culture. And um, it, the, something that's very interesting about, about Riopel's connection with the First Nations, you know, there was an interest very early on. It's very much related also to his love of nature, his love of uh, fauna, flora. But um, the, the, the real interest in Riopel is mostly inspired by his readings, by the exhibitions, uh, by, so, by this very own anthropological view of First Nations. And when you look at the, uh, the, the recent exhibition that is now indeed at the Oden Art Museum in Whistler, we'll travel to Fredericton, we'll travel to Calgary as well, leading to the centenary year. Um, um, what's interesting is Riopel did not journey in, uh, in the Great North too long. He went a few times in the 70s, um, continued to study and be fascinated by the landscapes, you know, the iceberg series in the 70s and late 70s, uh, the string games also, that very notion of game uh, also deeply inspired him. I think the, 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 the connection is, is a dialogue, a dialogue and a way to not interpret, not copy, it is a very way of sharing the culture. Can you can you tell us about the dialogue on screen right now about these two works? Yes, absolutely. You see 
uh, the for Riopel, the uh, the string games were very important, and you see it in in certain artworks. Sometimes it's evoked in a title, and it has nothing to do with string games. But sometimes it's about uh, the the titles of the of the artwork. Um, the I think the fascination with that is really portrayed in the uh, in in the seventies when you look at this exhibition that went uh, to the the Museum of Fine Arts. You you find that almost um, playful interpretation. And the, the string games for the First Nations were also a very means of communications. I don't know if you recall when we were young and playing with those. Uh, so, and, and it is really that vehicle for culture, whether you see it in sculpture, whether you see it in paintings, that that's something that remained ever present also uh, throughout his, uh, his, his, his years in the 70s and even later. Fantastic. And I want to look at this work that was a work that, that is a phenomenal work that is in, in Quebec City, um, an epic work. And this is a work that Riopel, again, one of the things that marks his career and so makes him such an interesting artist is that his technique changes often. And so this here we're looking at um, a, a, you know, a, a very, um, a view of the work from a distance, and then I also wanted to put in a slide that showed details of the work, uh, and to also show these two figures, Rosa Bonaire and Rosa Luxemburg. Um, can you tell us about this work, both about the technique, mm -hmm. as well as as what does this mean? The the work was called uh, the homage of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, homage à Rosa Luxemburg was also an incredible symbol, a code, and we'll go through some of the elements, but uh, it was really his ultimate, his living testament um, to Joan Mitchell. So when uh, he learned of her passing, um, he got this creative impulse and uh, went and worked uh, on, the, on, on, on these three um, panels. Um, really, it's a code. Um, we have not fully interpreted yet. I think it's uh, there's matter there for for decades to be able to decrypt and to look at the the technique and to look at the various symbols. But it also encompasses everything that Riopel has worked throughout his career. Uh, you think that it's a new technique, but when you're talking about spray paint, because that's when also he used. Uh, uh, spray cans, among other, and everyday objects. You see life, you see death, you see nostalgia, you see nature, um, you see hope, you see regret, and the the technique in itself evolved. Remember when we were looking at those two pictures before with Pollock and with Riopel? What Riopel was doing was not was not dripping, it was a form of, you know, the precursor of spraying, it was spray painting, but with a different tool. So you always look back at, at the various periods of his life. Um, so Rosa Luxembourg is really the ultimate testament to his love for, uh, for, for Jill Mitchell. It's also his last uh, official artwork it is the one that tells the story of an entire career. It's the one that uh, we not so soon will be in, uh, finished interpreting. No, and not anytime soon. And that, that um, brings to the final slide where we began. And what I wanted to ask you as a last question is, is about Riopel's legacy today. And, and where do you see his legacy most profoundly? I think what matters most to, uh, to all of us at the Riopel Foundation, whether Michael O'Dane, our uh, co-founder with Iseut Riopel, with our founding members, we have Dr. John Porter also, a well-renowned art historian. We have collectors, philanthropists who are all gathered for one purpose is, yes, to honor his memory. I think that there's much of the foundation's uh, purpose. Uh, and it's true for other artists as well. It is to celebrate the past, but not just to celebrate the past. It's really to see how can we honor his memory by making it relevant again today? How can we honor his memory by transmitting the wealth of uh, artworks, um, of knowledge and the messages and the very passion that, that Jean-Paul Riopel had for, for nature? 
you know, it's if you took a look at one element that moved him throughout his life and career was, was nature. But our foundation uh, was created not only to perpetuate his, uh, his work, not only to commemorate his life, um, but to bring together the cultural world. Visual arts, first and foremost, of course, but just as diverse a diversified were uh, Riope's interests in, in theater, in architecture, and the various trades, art, artisans. Um, so are we. So we are working with museums, we are working with theater, we are working even with circus. Jean-Paul Riopel was a great fan of circus arts also, even back in the 50s. Um, literature as well. So bringing together, which is the reason he wanted a foundation, um, artists and arts in various disciplines to create that contemporary dialogue about the very theme that were dear to him, nature, environment, migrations, um, the, 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 the the small things of everyday life, when you looked at Rosa Luxembourg before, you see that Riopel was extremely avant-garde in his way of recycling, reusing, uh, experimenting, taking risks. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, he didn't continue for a while with sculpture, which he took on uh, again later in the in the 60s, uh, was that at the time he didn't even have money to experiment with the, with matter and to bring his ideas to uh, where he wanted it, and he continued to experiment. So that brings me to one of our incredibly important mission is in creating this foundation, in creating a large program for the centenary celebration, we also want to bring together today's artists and tomorrow's artists around the knowledge, around this career, but also to, to encourage them to push their own limits. When you create a foundation like this, you also have a responsibility to transmit the knowledge to foster the next generation of experts, of artists, of audiences as well. So our mission is really centered uh, on making sure that once we have delivered a fantastic program um, in 2023, uh, once most of the projects will tour, once this is all said and done, we need to create also an intellectual legacy and that's what the foundation will uh, aspire to. So we will be announcing um, within the next two weeks uh, our program for the International Centenary of Jean-Paul Riopel. And what we've discussed today will also really be reflected in the, uh, in, in, in the program that we will uh, carry forward. Thank you, Manon. It sounds like we are going to be hearing some very fascinating, very exciting news in the weeks ahead, and that in the in the years ahead, the next couple of years, seeing some very inspiring work take place in the name of Jean-Paul Riopel. So thank you for speaking with us today. It's been an honor to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.